Hello. Um, my name is Taylor Enoch. I am here today representing um, Samir Zeki and the uh, work that we do through his uh, laboratory, the Laboratory of Neurobiology at UCL. Um, I will begin uh, by saying a little something about uh, what neuroaesthetics is and what it is not. Um, neuroaesthetics is not an attempt to define beauty or art. Uh, for that matter, in terms of the function of the human brain, such that uh, there is some magical part in the brain that, as it were, lights up, and when it lights up, we are experiencing beauty. Um, rather, what neuroaesthetics is, is an attempt to better understand the function of the human brain in light of certain uh, experiences, namely the experiences of beauty and the experiences of certain stimuli that we happen to call art. Um, now, beauty matters, of course, because it helps us to better understand the function of the human brain, um, at least from a neuroaesthetic point of view. But from the point of view of both neuroaesthetics and elsewhere, uh, beauty matters because it satisfies. Now, what does it satisfy? Um, we find satisfaction in the stabilization of the otherwise unstable. And one of the primordial functions of the human brain is to acquire knowledge. And in order to acquire knowledge, um, the brain must first stabilize an exterior world that is itself quite unstable. And it must acquire knowledge in order to act, we must make sense of the world in order to be agents in it. From an evolutionary story, this is to say, survive. Um, the story of stabilization is perhaps best explained in terms of color vision. Um, take, for instance, this red book. When viewed under tungsten light or um, fluorescent light or outside sunlight on a rainy day, on a sunny day, we are bombarded with um, variable and unstable profiles of different wavelengths that our, uh, our visual apparatus is receiving. And yet we constantly categorize this as red. So this is an example of the brain, and perhaps in the Q&A I can say a little bit more. The brain has particular mechanisms that stabilize this unstable um, information. And beauty, we, from a neuroaesthetic point of view, is an experience that signifies this stability or satisfaction of the brain. Now, architecture is, of course, amongst other things, um, a visual art. And so when we talk about um, understanding the brain in terms of um, the experience of beauty, we're talking about the visual brain. Now, the visual brain, I have a, a basic diagram up here, is a collection of brain areas that um, contribute to our sense of vision. They are chiefly composed of visual areas one through five, located in the occipital lobe at the back of the brain, in addition to a number of associated areas. So for instance, areas associated with um, object recognition, the LOC, areas associated with face and body recognition, such as the fusiform face and body uh, areas down at the bottom. But curiously also, this area known as the MOFC, the medial orbitofrontal cortex. Now, the medial orbitofrontal cortex, in particular, um, area A1, field A1 of the medial orbitofrontal cortex, seems to be an area of the brain that shows significant activation when people report having an, uh, an experience of beauty. And it does so, um, Yale acknowledged this in her introduction, it does so, interestingly, irrespective of source of that beauty. So we see this similar activation in cases of 
sensory beauty, both visual and auditory, you see or hear something that you consider to be beautiful. Imaginary sources, you imagine something beautiful. Moral sources, you do or recognize morally good actions. Even cognitive, highly cognitive sources, such as mathematics. And we also see activation in this particular area. Um, in cases of reward, of pleasure, of desire, and of love. And anyone who's familiar with the world literature or world art um, would not necessarily find this surprising, seeing as how all of these uh, concepts of beauty and art and love and desire have seemed to orbit one another throughout the history of art. Now, interestingly, the medial orbital frontal cortex, this red bit at the front, um, is embedded within a larger area called the orbital frontal cortex, um, which is implicated in judgment and decision making. So I'll take the case of highly cognitive mathematical beauty. Um, beauty in this case seems to be a signifier of stability. But of what exactly? Of the logical deductive functions of the brain. Now, in his article in the catalog that I had the pleasure of reading, um, Ron, I think, does an excellent job at explaining how beauty acts as a guide for mathematicians to mathematical truths. And one of the ways I believe you couch this is there is an instance of finding order in, otherwise, in an otherwise disorderly mathematical world. This is very similar to the idea of the brain recognizing stability in an otherwise unstable exterior world. And beauty, then, is a tag that the, that the brain seems to attach to this experience to signify the salience of its satisfaction in stabilizing the unstable. Now, of course, this is only one of um, various ways in which we can explain, or perhaps better phrased, better understand beauty in neurobiological terms. Um, we in neuroaesthetics, particularly Samir Zeki's brand of neuroaesthetics, view beauty not as a unitary sort of concept that is definable in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions. I want to make that clear. We're not saying beauty is defined by the activation of the MOFC. Instead, think of a different structure of beauty. It's a cluster of different ways of understanding or different concepts. It's a cluster concept. And neuroaesthetics may offer some aspects of this cluster activation of the MOFC and certain um, neurobiological connections thereof may be one of these clusters. But the general principle that neuroaesthetics can offer through these clusters is beauty being an experience, an experience signifying the stability of the otherwise unstable it speaks to, the prim uh, to the, uh, one of the primary functions of the human brain, that is to say, knowledge acquisition. This is particularly salient, and it is why beauty matters. Thank you. Let me just try this. Uh... No, it doesn't work. One minute. Sorry, here it is. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. So, first of all, Yael, thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you for, for the kind words, your kind words. It's a pleasure to be here and very beautiful to be here, I must say. I was, I've been walking in the streets here for two days and enjoying every second. Uh, I was brought here on the ticket of a mathematician, so let me start with beauty in mathematics, and let me start with a simple story. Uh, some 15 years ago, I was teaching in elementary schools for 10 years, 10 years of my life I spent in elementary schools, 
And one day when I came back from school, my daughter, who was then seven, asked me, what did you, do, what did you teach today? So I taught, her, I taught her why, I told them why two times three is three times two. So she said, that's the same thing. Uh, so I told her, <clears throat> okay, please show me with your hands two times three. So she showed me two times three. Now show me three times two. So she showed me three times two. And then I asked her, can you show me that this is the same? So in front of my astounded eyes, she did the following. Two times three, three times two. You see that? One, two, two, two. <laughs> a, a couple of months later, I, I, I've been showing this trick to everybody who is ready to listen because I'm very proud of my daughter. Uh, and some two months later, I went to some other school, actually in a, an underdeveloped, in a, what is called a development town in Israel, so which means um, low social econ low uh, social economy class. And I taught this thing, and there was a student sitting next to me and saying, he said, "This is beautiful." And this guy realized something that every mathematician knows, which is that mathematics is much more of an art than science. If you ask a mathematician why does he do it, why is he a mathematician, in 99% of the cases he will answer because of beauty. I actually realized that this is true for any, uh, any profession. So a bricklayer may say that his, uh, what he did is beautiful. And I recall now sitting here, I recall that some doctor once had a diagnosis on some blot on my skin. He said, that's a beautiful diagnosis on his own. Uh, OK. So le let me give you another example. Uh, so this was the first. Uh, and another example is Pythagoras' theorem that everybody knows. Um, so I, I suppose you use it as architects. This is a way of uh, measuring distances. If you know the distance uh, east, west, and north, uh, south, you know every distance using it. It's an extremely uh, surprising result. And this is the reason it's beautiful. I mean, you don't realize why should it be true, this thing. Uh, and beauty, beauty uh, mathematics is not only a place where people experience beauty. It may be one of the keys to the secret of beauty, to the definition that people have been looking for uh, for the last 2,500 years. Because there it's so simple and there is so much consensus. Everybody will, uh, all mathematicians will agree, this is beautiful, this is not beautiful. Uh, and the topic of this talk, uh, I gave the, to the name uh, Beauty is in, in the blind spot of the be uh, beholder, but the topic is why beauty matters. If you want to know that, we have to know what is beauty. I, I know I'm presumptuous, but uh, let's try saying something a bit this, about this. So where should you look for the secret of beauty? First of all, uh, so I, um, I listed here math, poetry, music, visual arts, chess. Um, in all these things, people use the same word. And language has its wisdom. If it uses the same words, it's the same. And we have, we've had here a, an evidence from brain research, but it's really in the same center. It's the same. Something, there is some common secret which we have to find. And mathematics is a good place to start. Uh, let's start. So uh, we shall try to find a common denominator. Let's, try with math. let's start with math. So what is beautiful in math? So first of all, terseness. If it's something you had a long, a complicated uh, riddle, you have something short, uh, short solution. Uh, compression. What is compression? Suddenly, you have lots of information in one go. Surprise. This was Yael yeah, mentioned that too. And mainly a hidden structure that emerges. Now, in this example, what was it there? So, we are, <coughs> sorry, we all know that two times three is three times two, but this suddenly tells you why. You find the order. And you actually feel that you knew it before. There is a Jewish legend that when a boy is, be is born, he knows all the Torah, the 
um, religious uh, uh, writings. And a, an angel comes and hits him here, and he forgets everything. Uh, and that's why we have this little uh, uh, cavity here. Okay, uh, actually, if you check by this, by this legend, girls shouldn't have this because the girls don't know the Torah by the Jewish religion. Um, so this is the same here. We, we, we knew it, that this is the reason. And suddenly, somebody tells us. Uh, okay. And, and another thing that happens usually, very often in mathematics, is that you've tried to solve a, a problem in one area, and suddenly come, somebody comes and brings another area into the game, and this solves it. Okay, this was in mathematics. Let's go to poetry, because it's also not so complicated there. Sorry to say. So, again, again, terseness. Well, this is very known, that's conciseness, yeah? Poetry is short. Compression. You compress many things, a lot of information, into one word, one phrase. So Voltaire said that there is something that nobody can deny, which is that a poetry says in fewer words, gives more information than prose. Uh, surprise. Well, unexpectedness. The most expected thing about poems is that they are unexpected. Uh, truth. Kafka said that poetry is always search for the truth, so you discover some truth. Of course, this is true also in mathematics. You discover some truth suddenly. Uh, and then ideas that come from another place, you bring, you import some structure. This is the metaphor, of course, the, most, the thing most identified with poetry. Uh, so what, what happens in a metaphor? Metaphor is a wonderful thing. It does two things at once. First of all, it gives you a lot of information. This is the compression of a lot of information in one go because you bring a, a whole structure from point A to point B and say, this is the same. And second, it lets you believe, well, you're saying A, you mean B, but you can still believe, keep, uh, pretend that it is A. Okay, so it is somehow, you don't actually know it to the very end, that's what you're saying. Let's do, let's do music. Well, here we come to a much more hard, more, much more hard terrain, but something is clear that uh, what happens in music is that you hear sounds, you want to decipher them. Whenever you, you have any, this is what Taylor spoke about, whenever you have any stimuli in the world, you want to reorganize them, to make sense of them. You hear these sounds, which sounds chaotic, and suddenly you, you find the order in them. Okay? And the order should be complex in order to enjoy it. But you should find, you should be able to realize it somehow, and you must do it unconsciously. Namely, if you know precisely, for example, if I, if I give you this order, ta, 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 no music, because it's too simple. And you find it, you understand it, you suffer it unconsciously, and this is the reason that you can listen to the same piece of music a hundred times and still enjoy it, because you didn't decipher it to the very end. I believe that even Mozart, couldn't verbalize all the order that was pouring out of his mind just because he had this order in his mind, but not in his words. Okay, let's go on chess. This is something less familiar to most people, but there it's very, very simple, so it's worthwhile. Every tournament has something called beauty, beauty uh, prize, the most beautiful game there. What is a beautiful move in chess? It's something that I would call it uh, mind over matter. Namely, you sacrifice something. You don't care about external things. You, want, you have something abstract. And if you think chess, and again, chess players do it for the beauty. They play for the beauty, definitely. So chess is about mind over matter because the whole theme of chess is uh, having an, some abstract aim, which is capturing the, the opponent's king, it's not totally abstract, but all through the game you, you, you move things on the board and look at material, but something abstract is hiding behind. And this is what makes it beautiful. Nature. Well, <clears throat> sorry, this is the hardest. Uh, but the beauty of nature is magic. Let me just quote a poet called Joyce Kilmer, who was killed in the First World War. 
Uh, this is his most f uh, famous poem. He says that poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. So what he's saying is that tree is something that we don't comprehend because it's, it comes from God. If you note, I skipped here something which is visual arts, and I'm cautious enough not to speak about something that everybody in the audience knows much more than I, so I'm not speaking about that. This is probably harder than any of those. And the question is, do all these have a common denominator? And the answer is yes, there is. The thing is hidden order. Hidden order. So in, in uh, poetry, for example, you say A, you mean B. The truth that it is really B is hidden from you because you can pretend that you're speaking about A. Okay? Or this compression business. It's too much to, up to grasp in one go. So you don't grasp it consciously. You grasp the order, but not totally consciously. The same goes for mathematics. When somebody brings you a solution which is beautiful, then you understand it, but not totally. There is some order that is way behind you. The most, the nicest formulas are so deep that we shall never fathom them. So uh, it's hidden order and hidden truth, hidden structures. Uh, things are too fast to comprehend consciously. This is what I think beauty is about, or at least one secret of beauty. And this, uh, okay, let me just give you here uh, two citations uh, from poets. So Samuel Butler said that the, the less you understand a poem, the more impressed you are by the magic. So again, magic. Beauty is about magic. And uh, another saying that a poem is a reverse pickpocket. What does it mean? It puts in your, into your pocket something without your notice. Uh, and this is why I called my talk Beauty is in the Blind Spot of the Beholder. And let me finish here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you, and I wonder now if you have any question to each other, anything that you want, you're eager to use the opportunity and ask uh, one another? I'm fascinated by this, but I don't know how to ask because it's beyond me completely, this uh, <laughs> brain research. <laughs> so what do you think? Do you have uh, any question to, to Yeah, Yeah, um, I think it's really interesting, this idea of hidden order mm -hmm. um, as a uh, a signifier of beauty, or um, perhaps the the single factor, um, especially in mathematical beauty. Um, but what about when the order isn't quite so hidden, right? When we can recognize why something is beautiful. So this isn't always the case. Um, one of the examples that Zeki uses quite often is a beautiful person walking into a room. And you can recognize the beauty in the face, for instance, um, without being able necessarily to explain what about That's the face it. is itself explain. beautiful. You cannot tell, you can tell that a woman is beautiful, but you cannot really say why. I mean, she has nice features, young features, uh, smooth skin, but that doesn't, uh, doesn't summarize it all. I think there it's also hidden in some way. Of course, I didn't. I omitted also that because this is also very hard. Why are faces beautiful? Is um, but you see that there is a, there are researchers that say that the more symmetric you are, the more beautiful you are, and symmetry is of course order. Uh, but uh, and, and there we were going into evolutionary ideas that uh, you want you are looking for somebody who has better survival chances and, uh, and somebody who is orderly, who is probably healthy, and such things, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I do think that's a really interesting um, point to bring up, this evolutionary story that could be told in terms of uh, reproductive fitness or something like mm -hmm. that, um, ability to survive. Um, this also looks at how beauty is sort of pluralistic in that it also feeds into experiences of love, um, where many times we 
might find somebody beautiful, perhaps explainable in terms of evolutionary fittedness, and so, and so find ourselves falling in love with them, which is fine for, say, um, people who can reproduce, uh, re heterosexual people at the age of reproduction. Um, but what about homosexual relationships? What about relationships past the age of reproduction? Um, there's something interesting, at least to me, where people even outside of the context of evolutionary um, reproduction can find beauty in other humans and can uh, end up falling in love with them. Uh, and we do find uh, subjects, uh, not as similar objects. activation patterns. Sorry? As subjects, not as subjects. Yes. So, yeah, El can testify that there is a famous poem by, by Bialik, the national poet, uh, that says in which a girl uh, is looking for her groom and she said, but only not old, only not old. So, <laughs> you know, Achluzak and Achluzak. And, uh, yeah, and uh, it's true that uh, we're going into another direction, but uh, it's true that the less, uh, the, the older you are, the less uh, attractive you are. There's nothing to be done about it. I am at the age and I can <laughs> testify. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but this is another story. The story is also, it's not only evolution, but also education, because, you know, we don't know how to appreciate, I don't know how to appreciate Arabic music. And they are just enchanted, they're moved by it. By the way, I haven't, I haven't spoken about this, the thing that beauty moves us. I don't, <clears throat> sorry, I don't quite understand why you are moved by it, but this is by a, a Bach a piece can just move you, you will be elated. Why? I have no idea. Uh, the pleasure is clear, so I didn't mention, but there is a theory of Herbert Spencer it's from the 19th century. You probably know it. It is about. Uh, it was in neurology, actually, uh, that uh, we want to stabilize. Yeah, actually, you spoke about it. Yeah, the brain wants stabilization, which is minimization of energy. That was the idea, and minimization of energy is that you uh, you perceive order. When you have order, you don't need to expend so much energy. And the, the energy that you prepared for tackling your job, for the, the recognition of the, uh, of the situation, of the state, um, is turned into uh, pleasure. That's what it's, but this is not moving. This is just pleasure. I don't know why moving. No idea. Somebody else has to think about and tell me why you are moved by poetry. But, well, poetry, okay, you, it really touches, it's a way to touch your innermost feelings. Okay, music, why is it the way to touch your innermost feelings? No idea. Uh, but pleasure, yes, you can understand pleasure by saving energy. You don't have to, just like when you, say, you beat your opponent, you're, you're victorious over an opponent, you don't need to expend any more energy, and that's why you're gleeful, because you know, the, all the energy that you prepared to, uh, to tackle him, now it's free. You can do it with you. You can go to the movies with, without having to tackle to fight. Uh, so there is this education which tells you. But this is also in favor of the theory of order because if you are educated to hear Arabic music, then uh, then you can find the order there. You know, their order is very complicated. They have quarters of tones and such things, which I, I, I turn off the radio when I hear <laughs> Arabic music. Uh, but for them, it's really moving. There, there can be. Uh, and uh, so it's, when you get educated, you learn this type of order. You recognize, so when you first hear classical music, um, you don't understand what it's about. And that's why you have to first uh, hear simple classical music. I remember that the first classical music, I, I came from a not really musical house, and the first classical music that I heard was the Toria Door by Bizet in Carmen. It was at the age of 12, 13, and I decided that's the most beautiful thing that ever existed. <laughs> of course, today it would be, a, I mean, I'm a great admirer of Bizet, but uh, it's, it's Quite simple, and many people get such pieces to first love. So it's, it takes you some education, some 
uh, ability to recognize the odor in order to appreciate some music. Uh, it's interesting to think what happens in modern music because sometimes you never get used to it. Uh, but you but do perhaps, a bit. perhaps the ambition was not beauty anyhow. Sorry? Perhaps the ambition was uh -huh, not yes, pursuing perhaps, beauty. Uh, yeah, so they want to reflect the ugliness of the world. Other, <laughs> other things. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think we will. Uh, you wrote something in your book that uh, I keep kind of uh, thinking about it. And when we discussed, I discussed your book with Samir Zaki because we were both really touched. I think it's a very, very special book. It touched anybody. I think anybody I know who read it is really touched by it. But you said something was kind of uh, revealing for me, and maybe it's obvious, but obvious for you as a mathematician. But it was a very interesting comment that you said that uh, you know if. Euler, let's say, you didn't say it this way, but just what I got from it, that is a mathematician, let's say, he wouldn't be alive, like Euler, who brought the most beautiful equation. Uh -huh, yeah. uh, then uh, somebody Some, else somebody would have found it. Yeah, ma mathematics, but, uh, you yeah, discover, but, 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 you're not but, but, un but, but then you continue and you say that unlike Schubert. in mathematics, if Schubert, if Schubert <laughs> lived for another year, we would be much happier. Yes, one <laughs> yes. more year. So I think it was a very beautiful uh, kind of you know thought that you you put it in words, you express it, and then when you read it, you say, yes, right. But it's very interesting. Uh, so I think we are we have uh, we have five. I can I, I can see your watch, and we have uh, five more minutes. I think to uh, and. Any other question here, or anybody in the audience very eager and wish to ask a question by any chance? So maybe you have uh, one more question. Yes. Yeah. I um, this I'm really again intrigued by this idea of the order being quite hidden, um, and I'm very open to the idea. I think I'll say more about this um, in my discussion with Graham about how there's always well. I don't want to say always, but a lot of the time there is this aspect of hiddenness that we cannot penetrate. Um, a lot of the time, the charges against the neurobiological or neuroesthetic approach um, is that by explaining or better understanding our experience of beauty in terms of the brain, we demystify it, we take what's special in it out of it, we reduce it, we eliminate everything that makes beauty special, and by explaining, we sort of make the beauty go away. Um, I'm curious, I don't think that that's true. I don't think so. Um, and I'm curious as to what we think about um, does increased levels of explanation decrease the levels of beauty? I don't think so, but I think that, uh, like Sami Zeki sometimes said, it, and it's very common to kind of comment that uh, if we're intellectualizing too much, it's like missing the point because it's all about uh, emotional experience, and sometimes when you over-intellectualize, you really lost it, or, you know, so... No, no, no. Something. It, it, it has nothing to do with it. I mean, you, you can understand what's going on, and still, it, it's the same for jokes. So, if you understand what jokes are, this is something also that intrigues me very much. What are jokes? And the more I think about it, the more I enjoy jokes. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no, there is no connection. I mean, understanding what's going on, it happens anyway, too fast. When a joke comes to you or uh, you perceive beauty, it's too fast and too intuitive. You don't think about why, but uh, the interest uh, still is there. Why the interesting point yes. is still there. Why and, is and it beautiful? And you go into why it in another funny? book of yours that I highly recommend, which is like really amusing and fascinating. And, and then you try to explain certain things, which is kind of mm -hmm. very, very fascinating. But you know, architecturally, I think, uh, the beautiful things about the experience of beauty is that, you know, any layman or any, you know, we mentioned different professions or different disciplines, and at the end, the whole thing is about if you know nothing about it, you just feel it. But if you know more more about the discipline, then you can discuss more, you can understand better the orders, and so it's it's two different kind of uh, uh, experiences, but the. Uh, the, the amazing effect of, of the experience itself is that anybody, anybody can experience it. So, for example, uh, uh, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao by Frank Gehry, 
which in conversation is a very, uh, a lot of people like to kind of dismiss it and, you know, too much talk about it. But as far as I know, when people got into it first time, and still it's an ongoing experience by, you know, people who enter it, that kind of, they're in awe of it. And they don't have to be architects, of course, anything. And I remember a lot of, uh, when it, the opening was, I was not there. And I was dreading the English journalists to come, because they usually they criticize Frankie and it's kind of very fashionable to criticize them at that time already. And the old camp car came back quietly and they all said, it's quite an amazing experience. So I think that's, that's the beautiful about the beauty experience that uh, if you're a layman, you, you know, it's immediate, you, you, you understand it. And if you are a professional, you know, you have other levels of enjoying it. I don't it. think that professional musicians enjoy music less. I think they enjoy yes, it more than probably. other people. They must be slightly more sensitive. They understand to what's going on and, the and, and they go, can go on to the next, to the finer points that we don't hear. Yes. Okay, so thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. It was very good. And there's a coffee break right now for 15 minutes. So enjoy it. Thank you.